he found wells essential to living, a pitcher of spiritually the well of water that Isaiah 12, 3 says we are to draw out from the wells of water with joy. And Abraham would do that with sweat and with agony and probably with an aching back, him and his servants. And they would find wells. And Isaac remembered that. You know, it would be a good thing if we remembered what Jeremiah 6, 16 tells us. Return to the old paths. You don't have to reinvent this beautiful, glorious, life-transforming gospel. Go to the old paths. Go to the old paths where God has been faithful. The time that Isaac was living in, the time that you and I are living in, is not a time for endless innovation. So we can say how creative we are. It's not a time for experimenting to see where water might be. The issues are too deep. The consequences are too stark. We better go back to the old paths, the old wells, and dig those old wells up again. Now, there was a problem, though. The problem was that the Philistines weren't nice guys. And they had an agreement, Abimelech, the earlier Abimelech, and Abraham. Abraham had to fight for this. Thank God he was a fighter in the right sense. They had a problem because they did not honor the deal that was made with Abraham. And after Abraham passed away, really was gathered unto his people, as the book of Genesis tells us, meaning that he was dead, but not dead. Remember Jesus said in John chapter 8, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Hallelujah. So Abraham very much alive in the presence of God, but after his earthly time had ended, put it that way, he's dead. The Philistines and Abimelech's people, eventually, they went to those wells and they stopped them, the King James says. That means they plugged them up with garbage, with earth, with refuse, with stuff. They clogged up these deep wells. You say, why would they do that? Well, one reason is to let people know you're not welcome here. They had their own wells because the well would be a gathering point. The well was a sign that there was a settled society there. The the digging of a well was a great enterprise. When wells were dug, people would come. People would get excited. People would even work. Can you imagine that? The reason being, they could envision young maidens coming to that well, just maybe a few months or whatever it would be to get the work done, coming to that well to gather water, to draw water out for domestic use. They could picture that same well just down the road a little bit, just as time would elapse a little bit through hard work and effort and perseverance. They could see young men coming to that well with their livestock, with their sheep and their goats, and feeding their animals. They could see young women doing the same thing, for young women often did that as well. It was the gathering center of a settled life. Water. What should be the rallying point for the church? For you and me. Right here, Lighthouse Gospel Church. And every church that believes this Bible. It ought to be that there's water in our midst. There's the refreshing power of God in our midst. God forbid, because it happens all too often, God forbid that we would ever become a gathering point that is dry. I'm not talking about emotion. I'm not talking about who can say hallelujah the loudest or who can cry the most. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about loving God. Loving Him. Whether we're quiet or loud or somewhere in between, that's not the issue. The issue is, do we love water? If not, it's very easy to settle down somewhere where there's a lot of excitement, a lot of nice people, but the wells are dry. Jude, verse 12, there's only one chapter in Jude. Jude, verse 12, talks about clouds without water. False teachers. People holding back the purity of God's Word. Twisting, perverting the Gospel, making it attractive to the carnal mind. But caring no possibility of true refreshment because 
The clouds have no rain. My prayer is God shuts this church down before we ever settle for that type of a well. You say you won't attract many people. I'll let the Lord figure out the numbers. That's not my business. Amen? We want to be soul winners. But you can't be much of a soul winner if the life of God is not truly welcome when you gather. You can put people in seats. You can call them converts. You say, who's saved and who's not? I'll let the Lord figure that out. But I know that pure gospel ministry is digging some wells, going back to some old truths, removing the stuff that this world, the Philistines, has heaped into our precious wells that have been established of long ago. And so they begin to work under Isaac's direction, and he's, he's working with them. It's so important. I want you to turn to Jeremiah. Keep your finger in Genesis. I have a feeling this message may be more than one Sunday. And that's okay. Pray that the Lord would give His direction. None of us are smart enough to know what that direction is. That's obvious. But Let's go to Jeremiah. Keep your finger in Genesis. Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse number 11. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are not yet gods. Now, if you were to ask the people in Jeremiah's day, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they would quickly take a stand against any suggestion that they had changed gods. In fact, if you read the seventh chapter of Jeremiah in your spare time, you'll find out that their church activity, their temple involvement, was as, as busy as ever. So these are not people bound down to wooden statues. They're very much church people, quote unquote. Oh God, speak to me through this. Hath a nation changed their gods which are not are no gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. Verse thirteen For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. The plague of the nation today, the plague of our country today, I'm not talking about the church, I'm talking about our country. And our country has been facing some very serious things the last several years, and it's not getting easier, it's getting harder. The plague of our civilization today is too many shallow saints that won't dig, that won't push past past the garbage that this world has heaped to obscure, to cloud out, to to interfere, to stuff up the fountains that give life. It's not Washington, D.C. It's not your senator. It's not your congressman. It's not your governor. They're just men. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat. Just men. What this country needs are enough Christians to get some shovels out once again and to begin to dig those old wells of Abraham. The truth of the faith. Hallelujah. Instead, we're looking for new teachings. We're looking for ways to meld psychology with theology and make people feel nice and call that a Christian revival. A Christian revival begins with preaching like John the Baptist who said, the axe is laid to the root of the tree and the tree that does not bear fruit is cast down and hewn into into the fire, thrown into the fire. If we don't discover the purity of God again, folks, He alone can refresh. He alone can give life. There's no life outside of Him. John 3.36, Jesus said, He that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. 
There is only life in the sun. We need to get back to the wells.